you are what you eat. We've all heard this phrase and yet we take it in slight. At the time of making this video, I'm 43 years old. And today I just wanna to share with you a little bit about my journey with food and what inspired me to study nutrition and to become a nutritionist. And my aim in sharing my own personal story is to hopefully inspire you to think a little bit more about how you influence your health and your well-being by nurturing your body with food. So I grew up in a environment or in an area where there was a very health conscious community. And even with that going on, I grew up in a family that was from the Midwest. So we ate a lot of meat, a lot of cheese, and I was born in Wisconsin. So it just kind of seemed part of my nature that I should be consuming dairy on a regular basis all the time. Now, when I was a teenager, I, you know, stumbled into or stumbled into purposely went into the library as a kid to look for something to read. And I came across this book that was titled 50 things you can do to save the planet. And while reading that book, I learned that a lot of the rainforests across the world is particularly in South America are being desertified because it is cheap land for cows to graze on. And just because of the weight that they bear on the earth and the fragility of that soil, they were desertifying the planet. So in my, you know, thoughtfulness, I decided to stop eating red meat when I was around 13 or 14 years old. And my dad, who was the person who made food for us, you know, when I would stay with him, because my parents were divorced, he wanted to make steak strips and he wanted to make pork chops and he, he would offer me these things every day. And I would say, dad, thanks, but I'm not gonna eat that. And so I ended up relying really heavily on dairy and bread as my main source of sustenance, because as a teenager, you know, making nachos and tuna melts was easy and convenient and it made feeding myself possible. <laughs> so move forward of uh, many years, probably about, you know, 10 or so years, I was working at a greenhouse and it's a plant nursery. Uh, and we would get these truckloads of plants to bring into the greenhouse and we would actually have to you know carry them to the perennial yard or carry them into the greenhouse and after you know four truckloads of plants some of them have been just recently watered before you picking them up and you know hanging baskets that are like huge my body at the end of the day felt wasted because it was basically sourcing its nutrients off of my own structure because we need amino acids to do physical work. And if we're not eating enough of them by way of protein, then our body goes to our own temple to, to get this nutrition. So it sources from our muscles and, and people can actually start wasting if they aren't eating enough. So I found myself standing in front of the meat counter that night and calling my dad to ask him, what steak I should buy and how do I prepare it? Because I hadn't prepared meat in so long. Now, I also had a background of working in coffee shops and waking up really early. And so there was this convenience factor of food and getting some kind of calories into my system. So I would drink lattes and eat pastries. And even with, you know, my structure looking healthy, there were things going on in me structurally that were signs of concern. So I have a uh, bone spur or two bone spurs that are trying to fuse vertebrae at the base of my neck because when I was 14 years old, I did a backflip. I landed on the front of my neck. Feet were in front of me. And as I straightened out, it sounded like a xylophone was being played. Like... <laughs> And it was very painful. And I was told by chiropractors that I would eventually need to get my vertebrae fused together, which 
was very terrifying for me because I have always enjoyed movement and dancing as a form of therapy to transmute emotions through the body. And so <laughs> I had this structural pain that sometimes was so debilitating that if a nerve got pinched there, there would be days at a time. And it's like bringing up all this emotion because it was terrifying to not be able to move my head at a certain degree without just crumbling into pain. And I knew that it was from this injury, but the only solution anyone would give me was that I needed surgery. So, and of course, you know, I didn't connect it to anything that I was eating. I just connected it to the structural thing that was going on with me. So move forward, trek down a couple more years down the road. Uh, my mom was diagnosed with breast cancer. And in her final months of being alive, her body was so toxic that she couldn't even consume food. And so I was searching for something that she could consume, you know, whether it be watermelon or something really alkaline that would be really gentle on her system. And it was a struggle, especially because she lived in Michigan where there wasn't a lot of uh, support like there was in Colorado where I grew up. And when she passed away, you know, I went through a real serious depression and I had the realization one day that I hadn't actually been to the grocery store for like months <laughs> and I realized that through the process of grieving my mom, not only was I mourning her passing away at a young age of 56 years old, and I was 29 or 30 at the time, I also just wasn't eating. And I was basically sustaining my existence with Breve lattes, <laughs> which are lattes made with half and half. And I would add honey to them and... That was basically my, my caloric intake for the day. <laughs> and oddly enough, um, you know, it was like a, a two birds with one stone kind of a thing. I'd go into the coffee shop, I'd get a little bit of social interaction, and I would also get my calorie source. And people would tell me, you look great, you know. And meanwhile, I was like wasting away to nothing. <laughs> and the tension in my body was getting to be so pronounced that I could see it in my jawline in pictures. And my eyebrows were thinning and I could see it in just looking at myself objectively through photographs that something was going on. But everyone told me I looked great, right? And so that's the twisted reality of our society and culture. Um, and I had this realization one day alongside, you know, this, the awareness that I hadn't gone grocery shopping for a number of months, but I also had this awareness that everything that I was consuming was basically a depressant. You know, I was drinking alcohol to kind of help my woes and, and be my friend in a hard time because I didn't know many people that had lost their mom. So that was a really hard time for me. <laughs> yes, indeed. And uh, I realized that I hadn't gone grocery shopping and I decided that I had to eat something. And that that was the only way I was going to get through my grief and that I could, you know, tilt the ship to a new direction by tying my sails by what I was actually giving myself every day. And so I went into my cupboards uh, and I found oatmeal. I 
dried oats. I found nuts. I found maple syrup. I found coconut oil and some dried fruit. And I made myself oatmeal. And it was the first meal that I had made myself in months. And when I took my first bite of that oatmeal, man, the body thanked me. And I realized that in order to get through my depression, I had to feed myself. Now, prior to my mom getting sick and passing away, I had I'd studied a lot of different alternative therapies and I had a growing passion that was all consuming around studying aromatherapy and working with essential oils. And when she got sick, I made her blends to, you know, help her. And when she passed away, I realized that she was guided to not use any of them because they would actually build up her immune system when they were actually giving her medication to kind of obliterate her immune system. And so I realized that my passion wasn't really taken seriously despite studying it for 12 or more years. And so I decided to study with a nurse practitioner who offered a correspondence program in clinical aromatherapy. And in the process of doing that, I had to take cases. And so I would get cases for people and I would make them a blend, but I would also give them information along nutritional support and foods that they should be avoiding and foods that they should be adding in and supplements. And my teacher is kind of surprised by this because it's a course in aromatherapy, right? And why was I like, this was above and beyond what I needed to do and my reasoning for it and what I expressed to her was that essential oils will help, but if we don't get to the root cause of what's causing this condition, then really how much can they do? And I went from there to then study clinical herbalism and nutrition at the Colorado School of Clinical Herbalism. And when my mom passed, I had started... Um, really wanting to study nutrition because it was this riddle for me that her body wouldn't accept nutrition even though she needed it so much. And so I studied some smaller courses through different apothecaries that talked about the roots of health. And I, in that process, had a naturopath as one of my teachers that offered a food sensitivity test through blood work. And I learned through that experience that I was dairy intolerant or dairy sensitive, not lactose intolerant, but sensitive. And I'll talk about that in just a minute. And that I also should really avoid gluten and not because I was celiac, but because it affected my digestion and it affected my system's ability to absorb and digest food. And so I was like, oh, that's, in that's interesting information, but I'm going to keep eating my cookies and I'm going to keep having my lattes and, you know, I'll just tuck that away for some information to look at later. Well, I started working at this job where I had the ability to eat more consciously and choose things that didn't have those ingredients in them. But every once in a while, I'd slip up <laughs> and there is this cookie that was called the magic cookie. So well named. And it was the most delicious cookie. It had chocolate chips and walnuts and coconut. And I think there was might, might have even been caramel in there. Like it was oh, the magic cookie. And I would eat one and I would find myself driving home at 2.30 in the afternoon, falling asleep on the highway like falling asleep, like I was wide awake 10 minutes ago. And now I'm like slapping myself to keep my eyeballs open just so I can drive home at two o'clock in the afternoon. Weird stuff, right? But then I reflected back and in high school, I would always fall asleep after lunch in class. And it became so annoying and frustrating for me that I actually would buy Starburst and like fold them in little origami shapes to try to keep myself awake in class 
and it didn't work. I'd literally fall asleep while I was folding them and I'd fall asleep in the middle of tests and it was like the strangest thing. And it's really scary when you're driving down the highway and all of a sudden it's like the system shuts down and you were just wide awake 10 minutes ago. Pretty scary. And so I'm like taking in all these little bits of information, right? And then <laughs> one day I was uh, running some food up to one of the satellite areas in this facility. And as I jogged down the stairs, the nerve in my neck got pinched and I nearly just crumbled into a pile of bones on the floor and it was really hard for me to even figure out how to get back to the main place that I worked because I had to go through this building and I couldn't turn my neck like like a certain degree without just tears pooling in my eyes and so they took me to get a CAT scan and they determined that I have osteoarthritis. And at that time, I think I was in my early thirties and they were like, you have osteoarthritis, you're going to need surgery. They're going to need to fuse your bones together. And this is all kind of strange for people to hear because when they see me move, they're like, you have the best posture and you're so fluid in movement. And so this is why I'm telling you is so terrifying for me to consider fusing my spine together. So I'm in this herbalism program, right? And I'm in this nutrition program. And as I'm in this program, I'm starting to learn more about food sensitivities and food intolerances. And I'm collecting all this information and it's reflecting on me and my situation in life and I went through this process which we went through in the school which is a, a food elimination so you basically pick a food that you think you have an issue with and you avoid it for six weeks and then you introduce it back into your system and you watch and so I do this and I would start getting feedback like and I started becoming more aware of the fact that, OK, I'm making all this effort to eat good food. But if I eat me personally, if I eat gluten or wheat, it like I'm not digesting my food. So what's the point of eating all this good food if I basically just ate this thing that makes it so that I can't digest it? So that was a big thing for gluten for me. Um and fortunately, you know, that trial of being a teenager and having to cook for myself, you know, all the time gave me the confidence to prepare my food. And I think that's a really important skill that people all need to have, you know, instead of home ec teaching us how to make a stuffed animal and chocolate chip cookies, maybe they need to help us figure out how to make a wholesome meal for 20 bucks. Just my opinion. So I had already figured out the gluten thing, right? But I was still kind of uh, fighting the dairy thing because, you know, I'm from Wisconsin. I love dairy. I love cheese. I love bread and cheese together. They're great. They're awesome. <laughs> They're delicious. They're comforting. They're all the things, right? But I had this situation happen where I was at this workshop and teaching at this workshop and it was supposed to be... Uh, all dairy-free catered food. Of course, there's some for people who like dairy. Um, but I, I went to town on this almond cheese, man. I just was like so excited to have something that was cheese-like that I didn't have to make. <laughs> and because you can make your own cheeses with like almonds and cashews and things. That's another video. Uh, so I ate so much of this cheese, this almond cheese. And I... Then the next day we were celebrating and we went out to dinner because it was the end of the workshop. And as I was talking to someone, I realized that words were coming out of my mouth that I wasn't intending to say. Like I would want to say mushroom or, or mustard and it came out as mushroom. It was like close, but not quite, you know? And 
I mentioned this to my friend at the table and she's like, you dosed yourself. And I was like, what did I dose myself on? Because that's a term for eating the food that you know you shouldn't eat, right? You got dosed. And so she actually went back to the house, went rummaged through the rubbish container and found the, the package for this almond cheese. And it was basically thickened with casinate or casein, which is a protein of dairy. And so that's when I realized that I actually get affected by dairy in my mind. Like it messes with my brain. It literally makes me a cheese head. Okay. And I will like say the wrong shape when I'm referring to a rectangle in a yoga class. I'll say triangle, right? If I've had any dairy, it literally like rewires something in my brain. And it also negatively affects my skin. And all throughout childhood, I had acne that I was battling and I was very self-conscious about. And then I realized that, oh, well, milk is pretty much like hormone juice. And, you know, as gross as that sounds, it is. And I was adding hormones to my body by drinking it. And it was coming out in my skin as toxicity. And so it's like, it does not fail. If I eat any dairy, even like something with butter in it, I will get acne within a day. And so I avoid dairy for, you know, some, you know, prideful reasons. And then also for my health, because I'm a teacher and there's nothing more frustrating than not being able to find the word that you want to use to describe a process in a class. And so I, I am so careful about who even prepares my food within a few days of me teaching because, you know, like if I'm at a friend's house or something like that, because people don't realize just how sensitive some people's systems are to these things. Like, no, it's not going to kill me, right? Not immediately anyway, but it affects my capacity to be present. It affects my capacity to use language effectively. And it has greatly shifted my whole experience of being in my body just by avoiding dairy. Because dairy, for me, really also triggers the muscular skeletal situation that I have in my neck, in my back. And you know, it's interesting because as long as I am super duper strict on not having dairy and gluten. I haven't had any situation where I've just like passed out on the road. I haven't had any debilitating body situations. Um, and I eat better and I eat better because I prepare foods that my body thanks me for. And so this brings me back to the whole purpose of why I created this video. There are a lot of people right now that are going through the dark night of the soul. We've been going through some really rough times. And one of the most simple ways that we can confirm our existence and our presence on the planet is in what we nourish ourselves with and for me I can have some observation of myself if I'm not eating that, that there's something going on with me emotionally right and for me I have found that turning the switch means that I have to feed myself and I have to make that effort. And it's absolutely pivotal for my well-being that I eat food. And it's absolutely pivotal for your well-being that you eat food. And that you eat the foods that your body thrives with. And that's going to be different for you. And different for them. And different for me. And like, for instance, I have a... A dear friend of mine that was in my clinical program with me. And she sat next to me every day. 
and she had this observation in herself that she was allergic to pets, like she was allergic to animals. Her histamine response would always engage around animals, and that is that was her experience. Well, we had a gentleman in our class who had a service dog with him every day, and he sat within five feet of us because we sat just, you know, a, a desk that was like right outside of the walkway from his. And one day around two o'clock in the afternoon, she made a comment and she said something in regards to like not wanting to sit as close to them, the dog and, and this gentleman, because her allergies were getting triggered. And I was like, that's really interesting. I was like, have you have you been experiencing this all day? And she said, no, just, just now. And I was like, that's interesting because we've been sitting here for the last five hours, you know, or I think at that point it was four hours and we just left for an hour to have lunch. And then we came back and now you're getting this allergy response. I was like, what did you eat? And that's when she had the epiphany that her love of Mexican food, Hispanic food, potatoes, everything in the nightshade family was actually possibly causing her, her reaction that she had always assumed was related to animals. And so she actually went through a lot of trial and error to figure it out. And she had a huge emotional breakdown because of course her favorite food is the food that's aggravating her system. And that is something that we find really often in clinical nutrition programs is that one food that we would want to go to a desert island with is the one food that is harming our system more so than anything else. It's like we have this interaction with it where it engages a response in our system, which is like a histamine response or a different response. But that, that shift has some, has like created a conditioning in us that we like create it. Right. And, and part of that is related to our upbringing and the foods that we went to for comfort. And some of us reach for sugar for comfort and which doesn't surprise me because when we got our shots, when we were kids, the first thing we were given was a, a sucker, Right. Here, suck on the sugar. It'll make you feel better, even though you're in pain. And so we create these habits and we create situations for ourselves. And so what my clients do when they want to work with me with food is I ask them to take a five-day food diary. And in this five-day food diary, you're just writing down what you eat, and what you drink, and what time of day you're doing it. And then you're also writing down any responses that your body's giving you. Because one thing that one of my mentors would say is that if you're getting some kind of gastrointestinal feedback after you eat a certain food, you should probably watch out for that food because it might be what's causing it. And it, it more than definitely is. So if we can avoid those foods, we won't have this feedback from our body that tells us this is not... This is not the appropriate thing for our system. So they'll do a five-day food diary. And, you know, in that food diary, I don't care about calories. I'm not judging you. I'm not, you know, going to bring out my pointer finger and wiggle it at you. I just want to get a snapshot of how you care about yourself, how you feed yourself, what your day looks like. You know, I think a lot of us, for some reason only look at food as convenience. And I saw this a lot in coffee shops as people would come and get their coffee, but they hadn't eaten anything for breakfast. And then they were just like wired up on anxiety all day. And oddly enough, one of the, one of the things that we ask people to do is eat a breakfast with an adequate amount of protein and veggies every morning. And it's one of the clinical ways of combating anxiety. Oddly enough, so these are just some snapshots of my journey with food. Of course, I have a lot of other anecdotal things to share and, you know, how I've worked through 
sugar cravings and wanting and craving certain things that just, you know, weren't available and how I made food that I could eat and how much more satisfying that is in the body because it gives you feedback and it'll thank you when you feed it. So if you need help and want help, you know, then reach out and we will figure out some time to do an intake, which takes typically an hour and a half to two hours for me to ask you a bunch of questions. And then we can figure out where you would like support because I can support you in a lot of different areas, whether it be through nutrition or herbalism or aromatherapy or flower essences, or even through different uh, self-awareness work that I do. So if you feel called to that, please reach out. And if not, that's absolutely okay. I just hope that some piece of my story inspired you in your journey with food and how you nourish yourself. Please take care. I'll see you again soon. Bye for now.